bless you. Those that have tuned in with us with some rumble, that's just a little uh, little promo there that you can pray for us that we'll uh, get these things resolved and worked out and fixed so we can get back up running uh, at the normal again. And so we praise the Lord for that. So just bear with us and thank you for watching. Thanks for tuning in today with us. God bless you. Uh, we thank you so much for it. We had a good group watching on Sunday school and Sunday morning. So we trust we got a good group tonight watching with us, and uh, thank you for tuning in with us. So God bless you. Take your Bibles and open them to the book of Matthew. We're going back to the end of Matthew chapter 5. I missed this last week and jumped into 6. So we're falling back on this one, and then we'll go back into chapter 6 again next week, and we'll pick it up with verse number 5 uh, through probably 15. Uh, yes, 5 through 15 as we're looking at chapter 6 when Jesus gives us three keys to worship and how we're to worship. And so we'll pick that up next week. But tonight we're going to close out chapter 5 and we're looking at straight talk about your enemies. Straight talk about your enemies. It's a straight talk with Jesus, 18 minutes. And by the way, would you agree with me? We're living in a culture that celebrates it and rewards revenge and retaliation. But we're living in a culture today that celebrates and rewards revenge and retaliation. I mean, it really, really is. So how do we deal with our enemies? How do we deal with people who have wronged us, scammed us, conned us, cheated us, hurt us deeply? How do we do that? The, the flesh would say, get even. The flesh would say, get back. The flesh would say, retaliate. Well, we're going to look and see what Jesus says, how we're to handle it and do it tonight. All right? From the Word of God, you're going to learn something really cool tonight. I guarantee you probably never thought of it or heard of it before, but you will tonight. All right? I guarantee you. So, hey, let's face it. Loving people who hate you and turning the other cheek. Don't you love it? To those who want to destroy you is not a popular idea. So how are we to understand and apply Jesus' commands in the culture in which restraint is seen as a vice and retaliation is viewed as a virtue. So again, tonight we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And again, the Sermon on the Mount, verses 5, 6, and 7, is not a checklist for you on, on how to get into heaven. It's a teaching on how you and I to live our lives now that we are saved and know we are going to heaven. That's the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're looking at three key distinctions for understanding. And so what is it that we want to understand tonight, beginning in chapter 5 here of Matthew, and what we're looking at in this chapter, and we're going to look at it here in just a minute. Father, be with us tonight, please. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher and our guide, and certainly as we always, we ask for your help, for your wisdom, for your understanding, for your anointing in this hour, that you would grant to us illumination that we might have understanding of the Word, that we'll learn and hear some new things tonight, that we can apply them to our lives and grant us the wisdom to do so and speak to our hearts tonight. And as the Spirit says and the Lord says, to him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And Jesus said it many times over in his Gospels, to him that hath an ear, let him hear. And so, Father, I pray you'll give us ears to hear with tonight and in wisdom to apply that which we hear. Bring to remembrance, please, Holy Spirit of God, the things that Jesus has said to us in our memory and our study and our time together as we have so much to put together and we always have to rely on your help and remembrance. And so, Father, we ask for your anointing on the Word, ask for your anointing on your servant tonight, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Three key distinctions for understanding Matthew chapter 5, because we're coming to the close tonight of Matthew chapter 5, and that is, is the things that Jesus has dealt with. And we need to understand, church, tonight there is a difference between vengeance and justice. There is a difference between vengeance and justice. All right? The definition of vengeance is a desire to hurt someone else for hurting me. That's pretty much what vengeance is all about. Those who have hurt me, I'm going to hurt them. And that's vengeance. But the Bible says we are to give up our desire for vengeance. We're to give up our desire for vengeance. 
Look at Romans 12, 19 with me and see that. Dearly beloved, what's the next word? Avenge not yourselves. Uh-oh. You mean I can't retaliate and get back and get even? No. But rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. We're not to seek vengeance and go after it, Jesus said. We're to allow Him and let Him take care of it, and He can do it a whole lot better than we can. When it comes to justice, justice is payment that God or others may demand from those who have wronged us. God could demand something or others may demand something from those who have wronged us. And see, we are to give up our desire for vengeance, but we are never to give up our desire for justice. Okay, we all have understand that. Take a look at Isaiah 117. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless and plead for the widow. We need to let God deal or others deal with vengeance on those who have wronged us or hurt us. We're not to take that into our own. That's not our responsibility. We have responsibility, don't get me wrong, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But that's just to give you a little difference of the definition of vengeance versus, versus justice. And there is a difference. Put it this way, in Romans 13 and verse 4, for instance, what we've been talking about here when it comes to vengeance and justice. For he, now that he there, by the way, is the government. If you read chapter 13, Paul's dealing with the government, the powers that be, those that are in official place that have power and rule, they are ministers of God to you and I for good. Are you listening, church? But if thou do that which is evil, you'd better be afraid. If you take out vengeance and take this thing upon yourself, you'd better be afraid. For he, that is the government, beareth not the sword in vain. He doesn't bear the sword in uselessness or meaningless or empty, okay? For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So we are to step aside and not to seek or desire vengeance or to get even or to get back. We're to let God handle it or in case let the government, those that are in the power that be. And you say, well, I don't trust the government and the government hardly does anything. All right. God's bigger than the government. Then we're to let God handle it. We're not to take the matter into our own hands. And that's where we get in trouble. Everybody wants to take the matter into their own hands, and that's where you're going to get in trouble. And so let's let God handle it, because He's bigger than the government. All right? So this is what vengeance versus judge, ju justice. Then he talks about individuals that verse, uh, versus the government. There's a difference between, in the Scripture, between individuals versus the government. Now we're not going to spend a great deal of time on that, but government is there to protect you and I. Did you know that's part of the Constitution? That's constitutional law. The government there is to protect its citizens. Okay, it's not for you and I to go out and declare a war, then let the government do that if necessary, and so forth. If they feel that we are in danger and people are after us or individuals are after us, that's why we have the law. That's why they're going to come around and do what they need to do. And again, if they don't, don't worry about it. The government's there to protect us, you see. And so we, we need to understand that there's a difference between that. Thirdly, the rights versus responsibilities. Now, I'll spend a little more time on this one. Rights versus responsibilities. There is a difference between rights and responsibilities. Now, today, that's all we hear from everybody. Everybody's got rights. Man, I've got rights, and these are my rights, and you're fringing on my rights, and I have a right to do this, and a right to do that, and, and on and on. And I'm like, my goodness, everybody screams and hollers out about rights. But there is a difference between rights versus responsibility. So how are we to handle our rights? 
Now, I've said many times from the pulpit, when you got saved, you gave up your rights. You joined a new organization called the Body of Christ. You got a new home called Heaven. You have a new king and emperor over you who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I got saved, I gave up my rights for his rights. He's the one that's in control and governs everything. So I really, as a believer, I don't have much rights. But we do have rights. But there's a difference between that and responsibilities. So let's take a look and see what Paul has to say in Philippians 2, 3 through 5 here when it comes to that. All right. Matter of fact, just to give you a thought here. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're to have the mind of Christ when it comes to rights and responsibilities. I believe we're to hold our so-called rights very loosely, and especially when it comes to others and how we treat them and deal with them. Okay? But there's a difference between rights and responsibilities. You see, I can voluntarily surrender my rights, but I can never release my responsibilities. See, I can, I can surrender my rights, but I cannot re relieve my responsibilities. For instance... Somebody comes into my home tonight, and I happen to be in there, my wife and I and my wonderful Belgium, and we're watching TV together, and all of a sudden a robber comes into the house and says, hold, stick him up, you know, I'm going to rob you. I can surrender my rights to him and say, man, brother, have whatever you want. It's all yours, take it. Have a blessed night. God bless you, and may your pockets be full. Okay? I can surrender my right, but I have a responsibility to protect my family, my home, and my possessions. You see, I can relinquish and lay my rights aside because my rights would say, hey, he has come into my home. I have a right to take him out. But I'm going to surrender my rights Take what you want, but on the other hand, I have a responsibility to defend my wife, to defend my life, to defend my dog, because he's part of the family. Ask your officer when you talk to him sometime. They'll let you know on that, okay? Amen. Don't mess with Caleb. I'll sick him on you. Well, you wouldn't want that, because you'd get all wet and slobbered on and, and lick you and kiss you and ay ay ay. The great watchdog. He's a lover, not a fighter. My goodness, that boy. But, you see, we have rights, but I surrender my rights, but never my responsibility. And so Paul gives us some orders there on how we're to deal and handle. Now, I'm using that as an extreme, okay? You understand that. But what, 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 what does it do? Now, here we go. I can surrender my rights, but I'm not going to res send, res uh, or, or surrender my responsibility when the government comes and demands and commands that we no longer preach the gospel in Jesus' name. I'm going to not, I'll be glad to surrender my rights, but I'm not going to surrender my responsibility. I have a responsibility, a mandate from God to preach the gospel, and I will obey God rather than man. See, I have that responsibility. I'm not going to surrender my responsibility. So there could be. There is a difference between rights and responsibility. All right, so we've looked at that right there. So we're going to move on to number two. Now we're going to get into it. Release our rights. Don't retaliate. Release our rights. Don't retaliate. Now Jesus is going to deal with that in verses 38 through 42. So we'll kind of go down and get ready to get into this as we've laid a little bit of groundwork there. Release your rights and don't retaliate against your enemies. Against those that have hurt you or harmed you or done you wrong or scammed you or cheated you. I mean, folks, that's going to happen. And you can get all bent out of shape or if you want to, but it's not worth it. All right? So look what he says here. And by the way, the punishment should always fit the crime. 
We don't put somebody in prison for 20 years because they stole a songbook in the church. But if they come in here and burn it down, you're going to prison for life as far as I'm concerned. And if I happen to be here when that's happening, I have a responsibility to protect this property. Okay, so make sure we're clear on that. All right. All right, so, so what, let's see. Look at here. This is great. So release our rights. I need to release my rights tonight, Brother Pat. i got to release my rights to anybody and everybody that's hurt me, harmed me, done me wrong, or whatever. Okay? So let's see what Jesus says how to handle it in verse 38. Everybody in verse 38, look in your notes. Jesus said... Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. Interesting. Where else did we hear that from? Moses. Moses quoted that in Leviticus, or Exodus chapter 21 in the Old Testament. But that wasn't an original with Moses. Moses got it from Robbie, I think was his name, or Ravi, or Ravi, who happened to be the ruler of Babylon before Abraham. And it was called the law of retribution. Eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's where Moses got it from, you see. And in his law of retribution, he said, if you pluck out that man's eye or knock his eye out, your eye will be knocked out. If you crush that man's arm, a limb, or take it off, your arm will be taken off. Eye for an eye, the law of retribution. That's where Moses got that and wrote that from that thing, okay, saying, all right? So just help you understand that. So that's where that came from, and that ruling and how that came about. Remember, Moses was the lawgiver. He brought and gave the law, and he wrote about 613 of them, and then about another thousand regulations to go with it. And then on top of that, the Pharisees came along and added all their stuff. What a mess. What a mess. So when we talk about that, see, Jesus didn't say, uh, so we look at this and say, first of all, what do I have to do? I have to release my right to dignity, my personal dignity. Release my right to that. Look what he said in verse 39. But I say unto you. Now what do he say? I say unto you. Now in that interest, you've said it an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, Right? You have heard. Now that's interesting. Are you with me on this? Okay. So I need to release my right to, to, to personal dignity. Jesus didn't say uh, don't defend yourself or defend others, but also at the same time Jesus didn't say that nations were to go around dropping bombs and we were to do nothing about it. We have a responsibility and a right to defend our country and to defend our people on something like that. And, you know, we're talking about a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye, that kind of thing, you see, and, and so forth. Uh, don't engage in retaliation at all, matter of fact, by the way. Okay, look at verse 39. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. In other words, don't resist an evil person. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, here's where you need to understand what he's talking about. Jesus wasn't talking about you and I going up and taking our fist and decking somebody and cold cocking them and breaking their jaw and knocking them out. He wasn't even talking about a full-blown slap in the face with an open palm. Now, I didn't watch it, but I saw part of the clip on it because it made pretty good news on the Grammy Awards the other night, which I don't watch, but it was on the, my computer. And if you all know who, uh, what's his name, uh, Smith, right? Uh, and he walks on that because he had made a comment about uh, Will Smith's wife. Will Smith got up out of the audience, walked up on the platform, and slapped the daylights out of Rock. You know what Rock did? He did not retaliate. He laid aside his right to deck him. He could have turned the other cheek. But he didn't. And he went on. And Will Smith kind of didn't know how to handle that. You see, uh, there, there could have been a massive fight breakout and gone ballistic in the uh, uh, Grammy Awards over that incident. But Rock handled it uh, very nicely and, and, and so forth, which uh, I commend him for that. Okay? Uh, but he released his right to his personal dignity because it was attacked by that. Now, personal, but Jesus in Matthew 5, 39, church, he's talking about personal relationships. 
is what he's referring to. And in the slap here, if you want to study it and get into it, it says it was a, a, a kind of a, a backhand slap. You hit him with the backhand. Not a full blown with the wipe them out. Not a punch to knock them out and break their jaw. It was a backhand slap, slap which really, really meant, uh, per, per, the, uh, you see it in England when they used to take the gloves and pop, pop, you know, and, and challenge them to a duel, okay? All right, it was a backhand slap which was intended to be an insult. It was the saying that, you know, I, I don't even think anything of you. This is, you're, you're just nothing. And it was an insult, and they gave a backhand slap to the backhand slap to it. It's what he was saying here on this. And, and what he was saying when don't, the right hand, you know, don't, uh, the on the right cheek turned him to the other cheek, Jesus was saying, don't return insult for insult. Don't do that. Release our rights and not hold on to them when it comes to our enemies. So release your right when it comes to personal enemies and your personal dignity rather than to retaliate. All right, Jesus doesn't want us retaliating. Secondly, release your right to personal property. That's found in Matthew 540. He's going right down these verses, 11 verses, and taking them and explaining to us how we're to respond to our enemies, to those that have done us wrong, hurt us, whatever, cheated us, scammed us, you name it. All right? Release your right to personal property. Look down at Matthew 5, 40 with me. And if any man will take, will sue thee at the law, okay, and take away thy coat, that was an undershirt, and, and let him also have thy cloak also. Okay, that was the outer coke. Everybody had an outer coke. Now, notice in that verse right there, Jesus didn't say you couldn't go to court and sue somebody. He didn't say that. You got to stay in the content and the context of sometimes when that is necessary. All right, if you're, all right, are you with me? If somebody's trying to harm you, it's not wrong for you to take them to court. Prime example, two of them, matter of fact. How many remember the story in Luke chapter 18? Jesus gave the story of the widow, that they were scamming her and trying to take her property from her and, and, and get it away from her and do her harm and so forth. So she went and she took them to an unjust judge to get justice done. And Jesus in the passage never condemned her for doing that. It's another time in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you call, now we're back over into Corinthians again. Should Christians sue Christians? Well, that's what was going on in Corinth. Everybody in Corinth was a lawyer. Everybody. Everybody in Corinth was a lawyer, and they were going around suing everybody for anything and everything they could get out of anybody. And Paul dealt with it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 on that thing. So sometimes, depending on the content and the context of what the right we have to do, but we can lay aside our rights on that. But we can also at the same time. If you don't think so, listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 19 and 20. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hungry, feed him. If he's thirst, give him a drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Isn't that great? Now, how many remember the slow word says, uh, Jesus said, uh, the, in the Old Testament, the, the, Jesus said to him, you have heard. Well, before that, you see, when Jesus said, you have heard, they were saying that uh, to love, uh, thou shalt love thy enemy, uh, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Are you familiar with reading that? You can go read it in the text, okay? By the way, that's not in the Bible. You won't find that phrase in the Bible. You'll find that phrase, love, uh, uh, love your neighbor as yourself and hate your enemy. That phrase is not in the Scripture. They were quoting the Old Testament in Leviticus 19.18. Where Leviticus 19.18 says, that in this thing about revenge, it says to love thy neighbor and I am the Lord. But Jesus said, they quoted, and they said, Jesus said, and you said, you have heard, it said that you are to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
Jesus said that's what they said they heard. That came down from the rabbinical rabbis and everything. But where that came from was the Pharisees added that to the Scripture. Now you won't go read it. Look it up a little bit against 19, 18, and you won't find that phrase in there, hate your enemy. See, their job was, hey, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. And you know who their enemy was with the Pharisees? Was the scoundrel, mongrel, dog Gentiles that walked up and down the streets of Jerusalem and those, mo those mongrel, scound uh, dog uh, tax collectors for the Roman government. They hated them. That's where that came from. And the Pharisees went around and added to the word of God, oh, we're to love our enemy, but we're to uh, love our neighbor, but we hate our enemies. Hate these mongrel scoundrel dogs and so forth. Go look up Leviticus 19, 18, because that's what they quoted. And Jesus said, you've heard that said, but I say unto you. Okay, we got to go by what Jesus says. Amen. So that's what we got to do. So we, we, we talk about this. Thirdly, release your right to autonomy. Autonomy means to do what you want to do. You got to release your right to that. He goes down to verse 41. Okay? He's talking about this. Look at this. And whomsoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, whosoever. Now you've got to go back in those days in Roman times, what they were doing. All right? Now, Brother Jerry, he's on his way down this way. He's heading west, okay? And he's going down to meet somebody or whatever, and he's moved, going along the road. And here comes a Roman centurion or a guard, a Roman soldier, and he's headed east, going back to wherever he made his post. And they were allowed to take and take Jerry and Jerry and tell Jerry, carry my, arm, carry my armament one mile. That was the law. And they had to do it. The Jews hated it. They didn't want to do it. But they had to do it. It was law. Then that means Jerry would have to turn around and walk back not only that mile, but he'd have to go back to where he started from. And look at what Jesus said. Jesus says, and whomsoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. In other words, go the extra mile. You see, surrender your, your right to do whatever you want to do and go the extra mile to even help somebody that's your enemy, which was the Roman soldiers. They didn't like them at all, okay? Listen to what Jesus said. So we, we've got that, all right? So there again. The fourth thing he does, with, he's talking about, we're talking about here, releasing your rights, don't retaliate. And so we need to release our right to our personal dignity. We need to release our right to our personal property. You see, and again, stay in the context and so with it. In other words, oh, here's what's great. God is sovereign, amen? How many believe that? Amen. He's over sovereign over the justice system. And he uses the justice system to bring about justice. You see, and when you and I want to try to deal with it and take it into our own hands, what we do is that we crowd God out of our life. You don't want to crowd God out of your life. Don't focus on getting and keeping your rights and crowd God out of your life. Well, I'm going to hold on and keep my rights no matter what. You're just crowding God out of your life. You don't want to do that. That's not what you want to do. I backed up to B again, so we did that. So now we're talking about autonomy, because I just saw it here in my notes. And as you notice tonight, I'm leading, using my cheaters, because I can't see out of those other things. I asked them if there was a return. There's no return. So I'm just out about $350 on a pair of glasses I can't use. But all right, that's okay. That's another thing, another story, another time. All right? So release your right to autonomy. Autonomy simply means to do what you want to do. Be willing to give it up. Go the extra mile if necessary. That's what Jesus tells us. He said, go to. Go the extra mile. Fourthly, on this retaliation, releasing our rights and not to retaliate. Well, some of you are going to, uh, yeah, well, you know, most of us. Release your right to your money. Release your right to money. Let's look at what Jesus said in verse 42. Now we're going right down through these 11 verses here. Okay, on the Sermon on the Mount. See what he's doing? He's not giving us a list here on what we have to do to get into heaven. He's giving us uh, some teaching here on what to do after we know we're going to heaven and been saved and how to live, how to handle things. Matthew 5, 42. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, and turn not thou away. Everybody get that? Give to him that asketh thee, 
and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. What's Jesus mean by that? What's he saying with that? I think it's the idea that you and I are to hold on to our money and our possessions very loosely. Because after all, they're not yours or mine anyway. They all belong to God. Everything I have and got and whatever is even in my pocket or wallet tonight belongs to God. Whatever's in my bank account or savings account or whatever, it all belongs to God. It's all His. And, and, and this way, when he says, hey, man, if somebody asks of you of something, give it to them. He says, if they want to borrow something, give it to them. In other words, lose, we, we need to be, now we're to be good stewards and managers. He's not telling us to be something foolishly here, but some of us hold on to it so tight we squeak when you walk. And this morning, some of you released it. God bless you. We had a wonderful offering this morning. I went out of here praising the Lord and thanking the Lord. Now, I don't know who gives it and who does what. I don't count it. I don't see it. All I know is they give me the report, and I looked at it, and I looked at it again, and I looked at it again, and Ted was sitting right there, and he says, what's wrong? Is it too low? Because he knows usually that's how I respond. You know, some I'll say, well, we didn't pay the electric bill this week. That's how low it can get sometimes. But this morning I said, oh, no. Oh, no, it's not low. It's big. It's big. Because some of you, and whether you're here tonight or those that were here this morning, I don't know. But all I can tell you is that somebody, God blessed somebody, and God spoke to somebody's heart, somebody's, okay, and they gave generously. They were loose with their money and their possessions because they have an understanding, even though they may have worked hard for it, they may have inherited, it's still God's. If we're saved, it's His, and it belongs to Him. And every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights from above. Every bit of it. We're to be stewards and managers. But God gives it to us to give it. And the Lord says right here at verse 42, Give to him that asks you, and from him that would borrow, don't turn him away. Now, you may never see it again. That's why when somebody wants to borrow a tool, give it to them like you're giving a gift because you may never see it back again. And if you give it as a gift, you won't worry about it. You won't fret and stay up half the night worrying about your $2 drill you bought at Dollar General or Family Dollar. Oh, but you might stay up a little bit longer if you bought a $200 Milwaukee Magnum hole shooter and, and you might be worrying about that a little bit. But that's all right. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 6.35. But love your enemies. Well, wait a minute. That don't sound like what we're talking about here. Man, I mean, I'm having an understanding here tonight between vengeance and justice, and I got that. Now I'm learning about how to release my rights, you know, my individual governments, my rights and responsibilities, you know, the rights of this. And now I'm learning how to release my retaliation uh, on my personal dignity and release my right to my personal property and release my rights to my autonomy to be able to do whatever I want to do. And go to that. Now I'm, now I'm having to learn how to release my right to my money and my possessions. God, you don't know how hard I've worked for this. Yes, you do. Yes, he does. Who gave you the health and the body to do it? Huh? Who gave you the boss you work for? Who gave you the intelligence of your degrees and whatever you have and masters and everything to make the kind of money you make? God did. And so be willing to, to share it and to do it and, and know what he says. But love your enemies. What? Love them? Man, the Pharisees in the Old Testament told me to hate them. But see, that's not in the Word of God. Go read Leviticus 19, 18. Did anybody look that up while I was talking? I'm sure you all did. Because you're probably wondering, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's got to be in there. It's not in there. The Pharisees added that to that. You see, folks, that's why the Scripture we're taught from the Word of God, don't mess with my book. Don't change it. Don't take away from it. Don't add to it. Because you do, you get all messed up. And the Pharisees added to it. Wow, you need to be careful. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. They ask for it, give it to them. We've had them come here and ask. When I was with Bible Baptist, the associate poster, old pastor over there, we used to hang out in the windows on the side of the building. And Mrs. Joan Woodward, she'd be out there watering the plants and the flowers and picking weeds and everything. And pastor's like, come in here, come in here. 
I said, what's up? He said, look through the blinds. So we'd lift the blinds up. We'd be peeking through, like peeping toms. You know, we're, we're looking, and there's Joan out there. And here he comes. And Joan, and Petra says, what do you say? I go, I want a hamburger at Crazy Horse. He goes, all right, you're on. What do you think? I said, 20. She's good for 20, I guarantee you. He goes, nah, I'm going to go 10. I said, okay. So pretty soon they'll come up and was talking to Joan. Pretty soon, here we go. Joan lays the water, trip hose down. She goes into the house. She comes back out, hands him it, and then he goes off. So he call, hey, Joan, what'd you give him? 20? Ah, we're going to get a hamburger. Hallelujah, man. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> she gave it to him, and I love it. And just like folks, these folks out here, they're begging on the corners. I know you think most of them are scams, and they're not real, and they're phonies and fakes, and probably a lot of them are. Matter of fact, they used to. You had to get a license to do that in this county. You had to have a license to stand out here on the corner and beg for, for money. But I think they, I'm not sure they may have done away with it, uh, but, but they do that. And uh, we've seen some of them. There was, when I first came here, was a man down here that did it all the time at I-75. And somebody told me, he said, you need to go watch that guy one time about a certain time of day and watch him leave. And he'd go walking off for a while, and then pretty soon he'd get on a bicycle. And he'd ride his bicycle over here, and the next thing you know, he was jumping into a Mercedes. BMW, a Lexus, and driving home to a $500,000 home. He was a millionaire. But he was out here on the street begging. I think what he was doing, he was just trying to see if anybody was willing to help. Where were the hearts of people? Would they be willing to help a beggar? I don't know what his motive was behind it. He certainly didn't need the money. And I've seen him do that down at my intersection. They'll get on the bicycle, ride a little ways, leave the bike, jump into some nice cars, more than what I can afford. And I go, hey, well, whatever. I see them out there all the time. And uh, sometimes my heart goes out and I do what God does. I just give to them. And, uh, you know, I'm still trying to be a good steward and a good manager of the funds that God has given me. But at the same time, I want to be a blessing. And I figured, you know, God gave me this money to start with, so it's not mine anyway. So I'm going to give it to them. And it's, now I've done my thing. And uh, now it's up to them, whatever they do with it. That's God's responsibility. If they misuse it or abuse it, that's their problem. But I've given something to them. Now, the ones that get me the most are the ones with the dogs. They got dogs with them. Boy, they get, they get. Oh, I, I give. And I tell them, now, be sure this is for the dog. You feed that dog. We got one down by Walmart all the time that's got a, a little baby pit out there, female. And I've told her and her hubby. Now, her husband has a grooming business. I've caught him in the grooming van. But he stands out there, and they beg for money, and they all bring these dogs and sit out there in 103-degree heat with them dogs. I got on her last week when I come out of Walmart there in the parking lot. I said, do you realize it's 103 right now, my, old, my thermometer here in the car, and you got that precious dog sitting out here in this heat? That dog, you, matter of fact, you yourself, you, either one of you could have a stroke, but you need to get this dog and take him out of here. This is not a way to treat this dog. It's just the way I feel about it, Okay. Look at what Jesus said here. Love your enemy and do good. Do what? Do good. And lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to, and to the evil. Did you read the verse? God is what? We are children of the highest, for He is kind. God is kind and, uh, unto the unthankful and even to the evil. And I always tell them when I give it to them, I said, I want you to have this in Jesus' name. This is from the Lord. And if it's a bigger bill, of five or ten, rather than a couple of dollars, I put it in a track. And I want you to read this track, if you would. And it'll tell you how to go to heaven when you die. In the meantime, may this help you or bless you, whatever. And I used to worry all the time what they're going to take and do with it, buy booze, drugs, and all that stuff. That's not my responsibility. If the Spirit of God lays it on my heart to give it, I'm to be obedient to the Spirit of God and give it. And let the, let the Lord worry about it after that. It's His responsibility, not mine. Amen. Praise God. All right, let's close it up and wrap it up. We've got to get out of here, okay? Last page here as we take a look at it tonight. Number three, love don't hate. Love and don't hate your enemy. Matthew 5, in verses 43 through 48, we don't have time to go all through it, I'll go kind of quickly. Love them, don't. Love and pray for them, church. Don't retaliate. 
Now, here it is, and I got ahead of myself. I kept looking at my notes. Where is that I wanted to tell them? Well, it's right here. Here it is, okay? Matthew 5, 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Jesus was quoting uh, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, and that's what it says. Thou shalt love thy neighbor, I am the Lord. And hate thine enemy, the Pharisees added that, by the way, that phrase, because it's not in the Old Testament, it's not there. Okay, are, are you good for me that? So that was a quote there. So we're, we're to love, not to hate. Matthew 5, the next verse. But I say unto you, now remember what they said? They said, love your enemy, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Jesus said, no, I say unto you, love your enemies. Number one, let's count it out. Circle them in your notes there, your Bible. All right, are you ready? What's the first thing Jesus said? Love your enemies. That's number one. Number two, bless them that curse you. Anybody ever been cursed out? Okay. Number three, do good to them that hate you. Number four, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus gave us four commands there we're to do to our enemy. You see, and he, he, he's dealing with the Jewish Pharisees here, and he says, now you all have heard to love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. I'm telling you, love your enemy. I think we ought to obey Jesus, amen? Especially when the phrase hate your enemy is not even in the scripture. Oh, uh, yeah, praise God. So see, we are to love uh, like, why, why are we to love our enemy? Why are we to love like this? Because number one, first of all, love makes us like God. Love makes us like God. That's why we're to love our enemies. That's found in verses 44 and 45. Okay, look at, let's look at it again. We read 44. He gave us four things to do. As a matter of fact, when he says, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them. You know what we're to be praying? We're to be praying God's best for them. That's what we're to be praying that ye may be the children of your Father. See, what are we talking about? Love makes us like God. Verse 45 of Matthew here. That ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So the reason why we're to love and not hate because Jesus has told us what to do, because when we do, that makes us like God the Father. And that we're children of God the Father. And that we're supposed to be doing, imitating Him. Jesus said, follow me, imitate me. Paul said that I may be conformed to the image of Christ in Romans chapter 8. Okay? So when we do that. Secondly, love makes us different from the world. See, the world's full of hate people. And a lot of people hate. A lot of them hate for nothing. But we're to love like this. Because why? Love makes us different from the world. All right? And that's what makes us different. Look at verse 46. For if you love them which love you, well, what reward have you? I mean, that's no big thing, right? It's not hard for you and I to love somebody who loves us. Amen? I mean, so there's no reward there, he says. What reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? He said, man, the Gentiles do that. Those mongrel dogs walking up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Those Jewish tax collectors. They do that. Verse 47. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Don't even the publicans do that also? Even they do that, salute one another. Verse 48. He concludes all of chapter 5. Here's his conclusion. Be ye therefore perfect. See, his conclusion on loving our enemies. Here it is. Therefore, be, be ye therefore perfect, complete. The word means even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Did you know that it's impossible for you and I to hate someone when we are praying for them? It's impossible. You can't be praying for someone and hate them at the same time. 
You know why? Because prayer extinguishes the hate. It's like a fire extinguisher. Prayer will extinguish the hate that's in your heart or your mind or whatever. So Jesus said after all of that stuff we've learned in chapter 5, we've had about, this would have been number 6 or 7 of the lessons in chapter 5 alone. And he comes to the conclusion, be perfect like your Father who is perfect in heaven. And you say, wow, how can that be? Well, in our strength, we can't do that, right? But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be complete. That's what the word perfect means there, be complete. Other passages, it means be mature, all right? So there's how we deal with our enemies. We give up our rights of retaliation in those areas to get even, to get back. And then we're to love them, to do good to them, give to them, pray for them. And that, folks, that's sometimes hard. And I've had to learn that lesson of being here even, of praying for folks that just didn't like me, said bad things, false accusations, everything. But you have to pray for them. You have to love them. You have to forgive them. And move on. Don't have animosity in your heart. Don't retaliate. Don't get even. Don't get back. That's what Jesus is telling us how to live now that we're saved and we know we're going to heaven for sure. Because folks, if you want to take this as a list to do to get into heaven, we've all lost. We wouldn't get past the first cloud on the way up. Amen. Amen. So that's how he concludes chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount. Last week we looked at chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This week, next, this next Sunday night, we'll look at chapter, verses 5 through 15 on the second key to worship. And what was the first key? Does anybody remember? Anybody remember what the first key was? Huh? Everybody remember? Help me out here. We looked at the first four verses of there. One through four. We're going to pick up the second key of worship next Sunday night. And believe it or not, the second key to worship Jesus deals with in the Sermon on the Mount here in chapter 6 is verses 5 through 15. It's on a subject you all have read and talked and preached and heard and preached over and over again, but in a, we're going to look at it in a whole different light from the Sermon on the Mount, and that is prayer. Prayer. And he deals with that. And I think the first one was wisdom, I think we looked at. The first one. If not, it'll be, there's three keys. Oh, and then after prayer, he's talking about the three keys to worship. Oh, the first one was giving. Giving. Wisdom in giving. And we looked at that last Sunday night. Tonight we've looked at the, well, we closed out. So next Sunday night we pick up the second key to worship is prayer. And the third key to worship is fasting. And you're going to learn something from the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus about fasting. It's probably different than what most of us think or have thought on fasting. Three keys to worship in chapter 6. Here we looked at seven things to deal with on how to live as a believer. Okay. Then we're going to look at how to, how to truly how to worship. And then chapter 7, I haven't got there yet. So we'll go. All right, so hang in there, okay? Well, let's go home. It's late. We need to go. Father, thank you for tonight. Lord, and this is sure something all of us need. We all need to work on it. We all need to apply it to our lives. And um, surely these things will happen and come into our lives. And first of all, our flesh wants to launch out and lash out and to get mad and to get even and to strike back and to retaliate. But we've learned tonight that you don't want us doing that. And that's not what you want us to do. So Father, help us to apply what we've learned tonight to those that would hurt us, harm us, try to hurt us wrongly, cheat us, rob us, swindle us, whatever, on how we have to 
do it. And thank you for a good example on the opening of the Grammy Awards with Will Smith and Rock. He handled it very good. Lord, I don't know that he's a Christian, but he at least handled it properly. And uh, it's a good lesson for us to learn when somebody comes up and tries to knock our jaw off. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you. Bless our time now as we go home. Give us traveling mercies on the highway, please. Watch over us. Be with our church, be with others this evening as we go from this place. Now, church, as you go from this place, may the grace of God be upon you. May the peace of God rule in your hearts that passes all understanding. And may his countenance shine upon you, for you've been in the presence of the Lord. And as you go from this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may he cause his face to shine upon you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The pen of the scribes is in vain. In other words, God's saying, is what I've written to you is in vain? Is the way you're behaving and acting, you're saying what I wrote was in vain? The wise men are, are, are ashamed. They are dismayed and, and taken low. They have rejected the word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? There's no wisdom today in America again because we've ignored the word of God. We've turned our back on it. We've gone astray. We've gone away from it. Talking about God's Word. That's what's going to change the direction. That's what's going to tell us what's right and wrong, church. That's what's going to tell us what pleases and displeases God is the Word of God. Not the professors in the liberal colleges. Not the professors in our liberal theologian colleges and seminaries. Question the Word of God. They question the deity of Christ. They question the virgin birth. They question God's Word, whether this is really God's Word or not. They question even the Trinity. They question whether Jesus is virgin born. They question whether He is deity in, in the flesh. Oh my goodness, no wonder our churches are in a mess. We got professors that don't even know the Word of God. And if they know it, they change it. The King is coming. He's coming to rule and reign in righteousness. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords to the glory of God the Father. You can stand before Him at the great white throne judgment only to hear these words, depart from me, I never you, you cast into everlasting fire. Or you can stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ and here enter into the joy of thy salvation. Hallelujah. Which one do you want? America. For an elect group. No. For every man. Jesus died for the sins of the world. He died for the sins of every man that walked on this planet since Adam, not just for a few select chosen people. God would have never put his son through all of that just to die for a couple of people when he died for the sins of mankind. He took on flesh. He clothed himself in humanity, lived a perfect and sinless life, went to the cross, was executed on the cross, shed his blood that we could all be forgiven. For whosoever will may come, let him come. And as they're going through even the suffering and the pain, they come to the place where, you know, I'm just tired and I want to go home. See, we get to that place that are saved and know the Lord and through the sufferings and the trials and the pain, we come to a place. I don't need to fear anything or death. Matter of fact, I'm looking forward to going Praise the Lord. And that's why we see how some of our elderly and our seniors that are saved, they say, I'm ready. I'm tired. I'm looking forward to going home. And so we praise God tonight. So remember the perfection of your suffering. It has a purpose. Okay? Remember the perceptive of it, how you perceive it. It won't last long. Okay? And then, what was the last one? Help me out. The purpose of your suffering is to be conformed to the image of His Son. 